Hey guys! I just got back from Washington, D.C. where I got to tour some of the haunted hotspots of our nation's capital. So join me as Los Angeles Hauntings Ghost Tours tours the District of Columbia. The first stop on any tour here is, of course, the White House. While I was in town, security was a little heightened because of this little guy. Though not ghostly, I thought you guys might get a laugh out of the paranormal mental image of Secret Service agents chasing a red fox around. Anyway, on to the ghosts. The White House's oldest ghost might just be one of its first residents. Abigail Adams is often seen in the large East Room. Abigail's spirit is often seen, still to this day, carrying her laundry basket and accompanied by the fresh scent of clean laundry. I can't resist the story about an American badass. So that brings us to the haunting activity surrounding new president, Andrew Jackson. Jackson's bed currently resides in the Rose Bedroom, also known as the Queen's Room, and his spirit is often heard stomping around and sometimes even swearing from the comfort of his comfy sheets. I guess even presidents want to spend their whole lives in bed. Or afterlives. However, perhaps the most famous White House ghost is our 16th president and fellow American badass, Abraham Lincoln. President Lincoln abolished slavery and brought a divided nation back together. But it's also really difficult to fight a civil war. This caused Mr. Lincoln a lot of stress. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? I mean, presidency. All of that stress was apparently vented by a lot of pacing, because the former president is still seen to this day pacing back and forth throughout the White House. He has been seen by all types of people, from interns right up to the presidents themselves, once even the queen. Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd were deeply spiritual people. Lincoln even made sure to keep one church open for services during the Civil War. All the rest of the buildings in the district were being used as war offices or hospitals. The couple even held seances in the White House, and these seances increased in frequency after the death of their son William. After her husband's death, Mary Todd was even photographed with the ghostly image of her husband behind her. Spirit photographs from the spiritualist movement are most often faked, and this one very much so, but it still comforted Mary Todd to know that her husband was with her after his death. Just across the street from the White House is another one of Lafayette Square's famous haunted residences, the Decatur Home. Unfortunately, the Decatur home is closed to the public, unless you want to spend a bunch of money to go to one of their monthly jazz nights, or want to spend even more to have your wedding there, you're not allowed inside the house. But that doesn't change the incredible history the spirits within the home have seen. This was once the home of Commodore Stephen Decatur and his wife, Susan Wheeler. In 1807, this guy, James Barron, was involved in the Chesapeake Leopard Affair, a naval disaster involving some deserters of the British Army. Decatur served on the court-martial board and was one of the most outspoken critics of the incident. It was Decatur who made certain that Barron would never again have command of a ship, a fact that Barron never forgot. And to add insult to injury, Decatur was given command of Barron's ship, the Chesapeake. All of this led up to the moment when Barron was finally able to challenge Decatur to a duel. It took 13 years, but in 1820, the two men finally met on the Bladensburg dueling grounds in Maryland. The morning of the duel, Decatur slips away in the early hours of the morning. He carries his dueling pistols under his arm. He never tells his wife Susan of his plans. The men fire at the same time, before the count of one. Both men have fired early. Barron is shot in the thigh. Tis but a flesh wound. Unfortunately, Decatur is shot in the pelvic area, severing an artery. The bleeding and dying Decatur is brought back to his house, where his wife Susan is screaming and refuses to see her dying husband. He dies in agony that night. The Baron Decatur duel has left its stain on the home in Lafayette Square. Decatur's spirit is still seen on gray mornings, slipping away quietly from his house, his dueling pistols under his arm, the same way he did on that fateful morning. Susan is often seen staring out of an upper story window, waiting to see where her husband had been, and praying that the outcome will be different this time. The sight of Susan at the window is so common that the curtain is now permanently closed in her room, offering the widow a chance to grieve privately. As for the dueling grounds, today they are a quiet park near a busy road. Although the area is unnaturally quiet, it seems to be at peace. If it weren't for the signs, you would never guess that over 20 duels have been fought on the land. Many men have lost their lives on the grounds, including 20-year-old Daniel Key, son of Francis Scott Key, author of our national anthem. Daniel died dueling his friend John Sherborn. Like they're fighting over how fast these steamboats were going and they were like, Bitch, I want to duel you over it! In 1836. Unfortunately for the author of our national anthem, his other son, Philip Barton Key, didn't fare much better than Daniel. But for that story, we have to return back to Lafayette Square. Philip Barton Key was caught having an affair with Teresa Sickles, wife of the much older Daniel Sickles. When Sickles found out about the affair, he became red with anger. Teresa broke down in tears and was forced to sign a confession of the affair. 
which was even signed by two witnesses. This signed confession unfortunately did not help Philip. He was unaware that Mr. Sickles had found out about his affair. So the next day, when Philip walked by attempting to signal Teresa, he was instead met by Daniel. Daniel Sickles rushed out of the house waving his gun. He ended up shooting Philip twice. The final shot was at point-blank range. Philip Barton Key is brought to the Benjamin Ogle Tayhol house, where he dies a short while later. His spirit is still seen on the perfect night for lovers, attempting to signal Teresa. An interesting footnote to this case, Daniel Sickles is able to plead temporary insanity and get away with murder. It's the first time this defense has been used in court. Daniel divorces Teresa and is able to regain his social standing by fighting in the Civil War. He even loses his leg at the Battle of Gettysburg. Mr. Sickles donates this leg to a museum, where he would bring people to come and visit his foot. To this day, the museum curators still see a very rotund, legless man wandering the hallways where Sickles' foot used to be kept. I guess it was his proudest moment. I hope you enjoyed my paranormal trip through DC's Lafayette Square. Be sure to follow us here for more paranormal videos. And don't forget to book your tickets on LA Hauntings Ghost Tours to see the haunted sites in Los Angeles with me. We've got some special events coming up, so even if you've been on the tour, it's worth checking back to the website to see what's new. And we're also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, so be sure to follow us there for real-time Los Angeles hauntings.